who do you think needs to be the most effective salesperson in that company, the CEO or the chief of sales? If you want to drive Ferraris and you want to live in mansions and have yachts, well, then you, you, you can't do it the basic, simple way. Yeah. So many people just go right into an ask, and I think that's offensive. Leaders can't blame other people. Wow. I think we're all here for a reason. I don't look at competition as most people do. I look at it as healthy. Well, you're a CEO. You're, you're, you're building a team. You're building a company, building an org chart. What's your recruiting process like? You know, I, I have an issue with believing everybody's inherently good, and that's bit me in the ass many times <laughs> over and over again. But I also don't want to change who I am, so there's a lot of the recruiting process that you're speaking about that I don't really get involved in because I want to hire everybody. Let's get this money. So my guest today is a CEO of multiple companies and a CEO that says, hey man, break loose of your ivory towers and get in with the rest of us. So Brian Esposito uh, challenges top executives to connect with the real world. So he proposed that corporate leaders stay out of the echo chambers, experience grocery store checkout lines and witness firsthand how rising costs and shrinking wages affect everyday people. A man of many companies, Brian Esposito. Welcome to the Seven Figure Squad podcast. What's going on, buddy? Hey, pal. How are you today? Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I was uh, doing some research on you before um, we brought you on, and I went to your LinkedIn, so I sent you a request, Mr. 40,000 plus uh, followers. And uh, I was looking to see the different companies you are a part of and how many companies you've affected. And I kept scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling, and it said, this day, present. This day, present. This day, well, yo, how, okay, so without me counting, how many current companies are you the, either the CEO or the chief strategy officer for? I'm just curious. Yeah, yeah, it's been quite a journey. So 23 plus years of building what you were scrolling through and presently there's over 110 companies within my holdings that I'm directly involved with. I don't take any advisory or board member roles. I think they're, you know, to an extent, they don't, not really effective, especially the way that I work. I like to be in the trenches with companies and managements and really ensure that I'm adding value. Mm -hmm. And then with that, there's over 200 joint ventures I've accumulated by building what I've been working on and currently proudly operating over 25 different industries. So that's been wow. my journey and world. Wow. So 25 different industries. So, you know, when, when, we're, when we're recruiting people into the insurance industry, because sadly the insurance industry has done no recreation of itself, I would say in the last 40, 50 years. But the biggest thing we say, we want to create a different demographic field to the life insurance industry because it's typically yeah. been reserved for older Caucasian gentlemen. Uh, now we're the leading you know, black and brown multicultural demographic in, in the industry. And let me ask you this question. We, we say the industry most likely to make millionaires of financial services in the insurance industry. And let me ask you that question. Which industry, with all the different 25 different industries you've been a part of, what's the most attractive to you? What, what, are, you, what are you most excited about all the different industries that you're in? Yeah, well, you know, I'm industry agnostic, so I, I get very excited working with startup founders and, and entrepreneurs. For me, that daily reinvigorates my soul because to see someone so passionate and driven and trying to make a difference, mm -hmm. it's not easy. You know, I know yeah. firsthand, I've been to hell and back a thousand times. So <laughs> the, the industry is, is really irrelevant. Um, I, I tend to say I'm not involved in firearms, tobacco, or the adult entertainment industries. But other than that... It's about the people, and I turn. I'm, I'm privileged enough this chapter of my life that I have, I, I believe, true freedom, where I have the ability to say no. So okay. I, I nice. turn down more business than we take. Yeah. And for me, it's about working with good people. I, I, I look for integrity, ethics. I look for empathy. And when I find that in leaders or management, then I'm like, okay, this is great. Now we can build something. Because when you take those things off the table, like ego and greed and you know, certain levels of stupidity, you really can make a difference. Yeah. But if people are out there just trying to make money and trying to buy nice things and trying to compete with their neighbors, I, I don't subscribe to that. that. That's an endless pit of trying to find happiness. And I don't have enough energy in the tank to try to fulfill those types of leaders' needs. So for me, it's... Just looking for good people. And then from there, I get excited about building value. I'm not the unicorn guy. If I start hearing anybody talking about unicorns, I'm out. I go deaf. I'm about old school business practices. You want to be in business, you need revenue. As simple as that. You want to stay in business, you got to be profitable. I don't know where it went sideways. And that's why I believe bubbles are created. That's why I believe 
volatilities in markets is because of these bullshit valuations that aren't sustainable. Yeah. And they hurt a lot of people and they hurt a lot of markets. So let's talk about that. You said the most, you said old school principles, which is revenue. You got to be profitable. Well, that's down my alley, brother. Uh, <laughs> I, I build sales teams. Yeah. So what, what would you say? So is a, a CEO, do you think the CEO needs to be the most effective salesman of the entire company or can he defer that skill? Um, uh, I mean, you can never defer the, I would imagine you can't defer that passion. You can't defer the, the, just the, the, the being a founder, just the, the DNA of that culture. But who do you think needs to be the most effective salesperson in that company? That's CEO or the chief of sales? Yeah, well, great question. It depends your definition of sales. So if you're looking at revenue, that may or may not be the CEO. But if you're looking at the CEO, he, ha he or she has to sell themselves as credible and that people can believe in. So that's the most important position of a CEO is to sell that confidence. From yeah. there, I do believe just like a baseball team or any professional sports teams, you got to put the right people in place, have the right skill sets, the right strategy, and give them all the support and confidence and tools they need to be successful. So it may be the CEO, it may be the chief sales officer, maybe the chief business development officer. You know, it's case by case, but none of that works unless the, the CEO has sold themselves as a capable leader and that people believe in. Yep. So we, we just went through our own exit ourselves. So uh, a couple of years ago, we, thank you, thank you. It was it was pretty industry because none of us had a college degree. <laughs> so I love the, it. the coolest I love thing. It. Uh, and so uh, it was just shy of three hundred million dollars. And um, and I decided to not take the check. I decided to roll it, roll my stock into the next deal. Good. So so I'm I'm uh, uh, I'm equity rich right now. Good. So let, let, let's talk about scaling a company from startup because I see you, that you work with many different brands and that you're very excited about uh, you know that that start that start founder type uh, feel. So to talk to us, if I'm a new CEO today in this day and age, in this post pandemic, <laughs> remote working driven uh, society, how does one start building a brand? Because one thing to say, okay, I'm, I'm a name, I'm a former athlete, right? And now I'm starting a company. I can l leverage my former platform, my former career, but look, Common Joe's like you and I, uh, they may not be at, look at that, sparkle, sparkle. Whoa. Common Joe's like, a, yeah, I don't know what happened there, but <laughs> I said Common Joe, it just sparkled. But what would you say for some somebody just starting up a company from scratch, what would you say for them how to grow their brand, their brand, their business today? Yeah, I got to work with, or I get to work with amazing celebrities, athletes, entertainers for a lot of my career. So. You know, interestingly that you said that, it doesn't mean that that would be successful if they just slapped a name on a product. Interesting. Before. So it doesn't matter. You need to have the right strategy, the right team, and the right execution. So when you're building a brand, you know, I, I, I like people to just strip it down to basics. You can even, you can even do it in a, a de-risk way if you have a corporate job or you're a teacher somewhere, but you want to go out and be an entrepreneur. There's a way to de-risk it and make that pivot where you're not putting you at risk, you're family at risk, your emotions, your, you know, maybe he's taking a second mortgage, mortgage on a house. I don't think you need to do that in today's age, even though a lot of people have done that and took that risk and have become very successful. But it, it can kill your soul and it can kill your spirit. So building a brand, creating a product, putting a piece of IP, tech, or service into the market, just make it very simple. Okay. And I like the idea of getting one customer at a time. So let's just say if you're gonna go put a product in the market, there's so many tools that are out there today that anybody can create a product, white label a product and start creating something. In the past, it took a lot of time, a lot of expenses and you needed, you needed a real budget to do it, but things are so much different now. And you can utilize things like TikTok shops or Instagram shopping. There's so much access to utilize your network. I think LinkedIn is phenomenal if you use it correctly. And get one customer. When you get that one customer, it allows you to make sure your pricing and your margins are correctly. You can interact with that customer if it's a friend, a family, or a social media contact that you never even met in person. Yeah, build it sensibly, and and also when you're building a company or you're trying to be successful, it, it really depends on your lifestyle. Like if you want to drive Ferraris and you want to live in mansions and have yachts, well then you, you can't do it the basic, simple way. That's a very hard lifestyle to maintain and continuously yeah. maintain unless you have a giant support system underneath you. But if you want to go and make a few extra thousand bucks a month or you know, maybe find a way to make $100,000 a year that could change your life, there's so many ways to do that today and do it in a very methodical, calculated way where you can create a very successful secondary business 
and ask people for help. You know, I, I, when, you, when you go out in the world and you ask people for help and you, and you be vulnerable, you'll be very surprised that you can start to create even a network of advisors that are just because you, because you reached out to them because you just said, hey, I love what you yeah. do. I admire what you do. I can use a little hand. I, I really want to make a difference in this life. And so that's your yeah. script. So, Brian, that's your script. Yeah. A, so if, if I'm Brian Esposito and I'm starting a, a new, let's say you're in my industry, you're starting a new insurance agency, how would you go about your network and ask for help? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's still the same model that it was for 100 years, right? You go to fr your friends and family first and foremost to try to start building out a network. And it's a shame with insurance and a couple of financial um, tools or financial service offerings, there, there's nothing really sexy that you could sell, right? You're competing with maybe price, maybe some sort of additional services, but it's really the relationship. And I uh, believe everything in life is the relationship. Yep. And you don't go and just ask. I hate that. I mean, so many people just go right into an ask. And I think that's offensive. You need to build relationships with people. You need to start finding common grounds. You need to say happy birthday, Merry Christmas, happy Hanukkah. Hey, I yeah. just saw you had a baby. Congratulations. And then maybe a few months later, hey, by the way, I'm, I'm selling insurance and you know, I would yeah. love to earn your business. You know, it's a much different situation than saying, hey, how are you? I'm Brian. I'm selling insurance. Will you buy my package? And so many people, people just go right into that and, yeah, and they wonder yeah. why they're not successful because they, they want instant gratification and instant results and that's just not reality. Yeah, it's, it's funny because we, we're at a conference and uh, to get into the conference to sit there where we're at was $15,000 know, per seat and there's 400 seats sold. And you would think that you're around people of that caliber that can afford a $15,000 seat and right away these guys are like, hey, listen, man, um, I got an investment for you to get involved in. Da, 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 da. So they're pitching everybody there and I call that like the 19 year old teenager move. You know, yeah. like I think you're hot and want to sleep together, you know, that, that, that was stuff because you don't, you don't have any other game. <laughs> so, can you break that? Can you unpack that a little bit, Brian? Like, how do you build relationship? Okay, I get text message, email, happy birthday. Yeah. How would you start building a relationship with somebody with somebody that you say, okay, this person might be not just a customer of mine, but there might be some mutual benefit and relationship down the road? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it depends how you interact with them. If you see them in physically in real life, there's ways to just. Yeah not be um you know not be like a stalker about it just be casual about it but i think most business and most relationships now because of just the way of the world they're, they're, they're built virtually so yeah. you know, comment on people's posts Pe people we all have egos right if someone takes the time to post something on linkedin or instagram or tiktok or any social media platform be consistent comment on there like it start building a conversation and through a thread you know what's, what's really great, unless they have a team posting for them, I don't. I like doing all my own posts and making my voice. That's, that's you. Hard. That's you. Yeah. So if somebody, you know, some of my best friends I, I have today are people that I met online and nurtured a relationship. But if you think of their reality, if they're actually posting and you catch them posting at that moment, it's like walking past them in a, in a coffee shop, right? Yeah. Both in the same moment, even though it's virtually, I could be in Salt Lake City, uh, New York. Yeah, yeah. But if you get it while they post and you're right there and you engage, whether that's yep. fate or, um, you know, maybe a little bit of, a, of an enforced fate, yep. then you can even send them a message because you know they're behind their screen and then you yep. know they just posted something. You could say, hey, that was a really great post. What do you think about this aspect of it? Got it. Build the relationship. Now you're starting to have some comfort there and you gotta be consistent. And I don't say, hey, just make that comment now and then go right into an ask that you wanna sell them something. Yep. You may never sell them something, but you know what? They may know somebody that then they introduce you to that they believe could be a good fit for what you're working on or who you are. And yep. none of that will ever happen unless you start building real genuine value, valid, valid relationships with people. I like that. If you see somebody on the sidewalk, you're walking by them, you'd say hello, right? Mm -hmm. Same thing to them when we see people in our feed. Yeah, that's their way of saying virtually hello. You should drop a comment. At least like it. I, I have a rule. I say if you like, if you see it for more than two seconds, you just better like it. If you watch it more for if you watch it for longer than six, seven, eight seconds, you better drop a comment on it. Yeah, that's, that's kind of like my rule. Um, I love well, one, that. One, one gentleman is the CEO of a Fortune 50 company. You know, we built a relationship again just by me supporting his comments online. That was probably ten years ago. Today he's one of my biggest investors and supporters, and tries to help me with everything that I do and. That was because of sending him Christmas gifts. When I found out that he was traveling somewhere, and you know, this this is just what I do naturally. I, I never needed an ask until probably a year ago. 
But I would send him and his wife a bottle of shampoo, champagne if they were in an island. I would like I would see where they were posting, and it may sound weird, but wow. my genuine soul is to I want I want to acknowledge people. I want to yeah. acknowledge people and thank them for giving me their time. I want them to know I'm, I appreciate them. And again, there may never be an ask, but when you build those friendships with people and you build those relationships with people, I think that energy is just very healthy for whatever you're working on. And and to know that you have the support of somebody that maybe you admire or maybe somebody that's an amazing, successful business person in the world or a leader in the world and, and you have a direct line to them, yeah. that gives you confidence. That gives you like, you know, there's something about my strategy and about the, the way that I connect with the world that that works. Uh, unfortunately, I think people just have it more naturally than others. Other people have yeah. to work on it. But you, you, if you if you don't know how to build real long term friendships and, and relationships, and you don't know how to correct things that may have gone sideways, then I think it's very difficult for you to build a really successful career. So I think what you're saying, a recommendation, then Brian would be to say, let's create a VIP list, like a, a, a relationship nurturing list, 10, 15, 20, 50, however long that is, and just find ways to nurture and develop that relationship over time with. And you're, what you just suggested that was gift giving strategies, right? Yeah, or well, genuine too, and, and that it comes from a good place. And it, it, you have your VIP list of people that are you know at their level, but you also have to have this like betting on a on a sporting game or or buying a stock. You also right. want to build relations with people that you know are going to be something. Yeah, and that you you nurture that. Maybe they're not something next year. Maybe it's ten years later, but. You know, people that are Up and elevating comers. in their career or they're elevating yeah. in their sport or whatever they're doing, yeah. you want to be there with them on the ground floor because then you really create an exceptional bond with some somebody that becomes such an influencer, a powerful person yeah. in the future. That's amazing. Um, let, me, let me go back to uh, uh, recruiting and sales development. So you're a CEO. You're, you're, you're building a team. You're building a company, building an org chart. Um, what's your what's your recruiting process like? I, we were interviewing uh, Patty McCord, the C. Uh, she called her the the the, the chief. Um, uh, uh, she's HR, and she'd ride in from um, the city to go to Netflix headquarters with Reed. But for forty five minutes, the whole entire conversations was, who works over here? Or who works over here? Who works over? Here? They need to work at Netflix. So so Brian, when you're building your teams, when you're building your org chart, when you're building your your leadership team there at the companies you're running and leading, how is your recruiting process? What attracts you for people to come work with you and for you? Yeah, every company has their own management team in place. There's different cultures, different needs, different expectations. Uh, I'm not a poacher, um, so we're not looking to grab people and Love try it. to get them better packages to come over here. I, I don't think that's good energy out in the world, but if they want to leave and come to us because they like what we're doing, that's a different story. Sure. Um, you know, I also, you know, I, I have an issue with believing everybody's inherently good, and that's bit me in the ass many times <laughs> over and over again. But I also don't want to change who I am. So there's a lot of the recruiting process that you're speaking about that I don't really get involved in because I want to hire everybody. Like I, I want yeah. everybody to succeed, and everybody. You see the best in everybody too. Yeah, I do. It's it's yep. a, it's such a thorn in my ass, but it's just who I am. <laughs> uh, right. So I rely on other people's skill sets to maybe identify if somebody's not the right fit or they have different motivation motivations and if they're just not being genuine. Okay. Um, but you know, I love partnering with, with people too. I, and I love creating a, I, I like use what I've built. I love when people use what I've built to help them succeed. So I, I also, to answer your question, maybe a little bit step further, I like helping people go out and do what they want to do. So if they're in our system or they're working with some of our companies, but they are an entrepreneur and they just they have this fire that I know that they, they can just go out and crush it. Yeah. I want to help them do that. Um, and I want to I want to meet them through our companies and through what we've done. And then I think my job is to identify these really great rock stars within our ecosystem and say, do you want to keep growing here with us or do you want to go out and make something of yourself? And that's where I really want to help people. So if they say, Brian, yeah, you know what? I, I worked here for this company for X amount of years. I think I want to build, to answer your question, genuinely, I really want to create my own company. Are you no. a, the type where you're going to invest in that company and, and get equity in an equity position in that company? And, Very and much that so. Way? I have a unique really? model where I would, I would be part of, if they wished me to be part of it, I'd be part of their team and I would help them 
do whatever they want to do. I mean, even if they're competing with me, I don't, I don't look at competition as most people do. I look at it as healthy. It keeps us on our toes. And Hey, if you want to go out and make something of yourself and do it better than I did, that's freaking awesome. Thank you. Because you don't want to do it the way I did it because I've aged myself. I've destroyed my soul on this process. So if you can, if I can be, if I can take my learning experiences and help other people do it a little bit more effect efficiently and, with a lot less stress, I think that's I think that's part of my purpose for being here. I think uh, when you bring up competition, that's the, that's what I'm looking at my phones, right? I'm, I've got everything Apple, and I think the problem in America today, in terms of the, te- the tech world, cell phone world, is nobody's giving Apple anymore a run for the money. Yeah. Uh, look how lazy their launch was of the new <laughs> iPhone. How, how la- and then before that, was, was there any real comparison? Why you should actually. Um, buy a new iPhone. I mean, I, there used to be lines where people like excited to get the iPhone. Now it's like, ah, blase, blase, you know? So really there's no competition for Apple. Nobody's keeping them on their toes, right? Would, would, yeah. would, would that be something that uh, is an example of an industry or a company that doesn't have any competition? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think you need that type of fire to spark innovation and you need fear to say, Wow, this other company out there is doing something that we should have been doing. So let's let's get back into the R and D and let's see what we could do to come out in the next year that blows the world away again. Um, you know, I, I don't have any internal experience of what Apple and their teams are doing. Yeah. They're obviously a phenomenal company, but I think when you get to a point like that, you, there's complacency and comfort. Um, yeah. But then you saw like BlackBerry and the, the, they, yeah. they didn't have the opportunity to come and fight back, but you know. It depends. It all, like, it all, honestly, it all depends on leadership. It always falls back on the CEO and w- where's the drive, where's the inspiration, and, and where's the motivation to always knock it out of the park. Brian, what's the biggest misconception that you see many people have towards entrepreneurship, towards being a CEO, towards being a founder, that when they're finally in the saddle, they're like, oh, shit, I, I didn't <laughs> expect this. Is there any commonalities there that you've experienced? Uh, yes. The most commonality for entrepreneurs is they don't have the right support system and they don't create a safe, balanced environment. Most entrepreneurs don't come from an entrepreneurial family. And even if they do, there's there's issues with that dynamic. Um, and they share things that they shouldn't share with their first inner circle. Like I've, I've had wow. this concept that you need to have two inner circles. You can't share any pending deals or any things that you think you've closed or a check that you think you're getting or a wire with family members or your, or your household because they don't understand the risks that you're taking. And they don't understand business because uh, odds are they don't understand business because there's always delays, right? There's yeah. always problems. There's always setbacks. There's always issues. So as you're fighting those battles in your entrepreneurial journey during the day and you come home depleted and destroyed, and your wife or your husband or your mom or your father or your brother go, oh, where's where's that check or that deal that you said you got? Uh, now you yeah. just want to blow your brains out because you don't yeah. have a safe place to go. So yeah. a, a commonality that I see that I'm trying to preach to people is either only share closed, tangible things with that first inner circle or share nothing with them. Like That should be a completely different aspect of your life. That should be a safe place of your life. That should be where you're sharing memories and creating new memories and just having a personal life and your entrepreneurial journey should have the second inner circle of people like you, people like me, people that understand that. No, you didn't get that world. That's not going to close. But we, if it does, we're there for you. But we, it's not going to close. <laughs> <laughs> you, you mentioned that the support system, because I noticed, too, that a lot of entrepreneurs, they feel very lonely. Sometimes oh, yeah. it's a very lonely, uh, isolated world. Where, where do, what's a spot that in your experience the last 20 some years? that you found where entrepreneurs like what you're talking about, where they can feel community and strength. Is it conferences? Is it events? Is it symposiums? What do you think? I'm not the badge conference guy. As an insurance guy, you, you might be because but Of course. <laughs> I'll take, yeah. That's a big thing. Uh, it depends, right? You can go there and feel more lonely too, right? If you don't have the ability to connect with people or you're not mm. utilizing that time or uh, doing it correctly. You know, it depends upon your social experience in life and how you're able to connect and share things with people. I think, you know, honestly, online and listening to the right types of people, whether it's on TikTok, Instagram or or LinkedIn, you can you can feel not alone. I get so many messages from people because I share I share how it is. I don't talk about Rolexes and private plans. I talk about 
hey, you're probably going to get your ass kicked today, but that's okay because the rest of us are too. And yeah. more money doesn't mean you're immune to problems. It usually means that you're going to get more problems and more people trying to get in your wallet and more bullshit you have to deal with. So yeah. when people can realize that it's difficult for somebody with nothing in the bank and just as difficult for somebody with millions or billions in the bank, you, you feel this common thread and you feel like, well, if they got through it and they're dealing with it, then I can get through it. Yeah. And again, reach out to people. I mean, you'd be very surprised if you shot a simple little note to somebody and say, hey, I'm feeling awful. I'm trying to be an entrepreneur. I keep hitting hurdles and roadblocks. Any suggestion or advice that you can give me? And I, I'm telling you, if you word it correctly and it's powerful little paragraph of a message, yeah. you're going to you're gonna get some support. Maybe just the right message that you need to get through the day. And the funnest thing about life, it can change in a second. As long as you're breathing and alive, your life can change in a second. It may just Meet, need that one extra text or that one extra phone call to somebody or that one extra push and all of a sudden you're, you're back in motion. What have you found different from, let's say, your accounting team, your R&D team? Because sales team is a different animal. When, when I'm coaching and consulting other, other companies, um, they think that a sales team type of personnel is the same that you can just, you know, this ladle to any other department. Has that been your experience? That, do you have a different animal that runs your sales and biz dev team? Yeah, but but it's not aggressive. Okay. Because my my top culture of all these companies I'm involved with, we're not aggressive. You know, we're we're, we're going to go out and earn business. We're going to go out and earn opportunities and create new markets in a very, let's just call it as stress free as possible environment. They, I don't have these competition vehicles where employees are competing with each other to each their own. That obviously works for organizations and it works for revenues and it works. But I do believe it also creates a toxic environment that is it, is the money worth that? And I don't I don't think it is. So I want people to feel good. I want people to feel seen. I want people to be in the right positions. And again, it, it, nobody can succeed in any company unless they're giving the right resources and tools they need. A, a baseball player is going to hit a home run with a, a broomstick and mm -hmm. the stadium and a great bat. And everybody needs the great tools and resources to be able to excel. And if you're not giving them that as a leader, yeah. it's not on them. You can't blame your, your teammates or your employees or your, or your crew. If they're not succeeding, you yep. need to make sure the right people are there. And, and again, they're given the right resources to succeed. So it's interesting you said that because earlier you said between companies, competition keeps you on your toes. But internally, you don't like to create a lot of internal competition because it can potentially create a toxic environment. What's the difference? Oh, the difference, you have no control over the outside world. Okay. But it can be used as a motivator and inspiration to say, hey, listen, we're obviously not doing our best right now. Okay. And then you start to analyze, why is that? Why are okay. we falling behind? Why are we not the sexiest person at the prom right now? Because this other company came out with, with something that we have the resources, the know-how, and the experience to be able to do better than that company. So where okay. did we miss? Okay. And that's where you go internally. But you, you can't, again, leaders can't blame other people. You know, it, it, they have to take ownership and accountability. So if you're a CEO and you're and you're falling behind or things aren't happening, you need to take accountability of that. And once you do as a leader and you take ownership of that, then you have the ability to make some changes. But if you're pointing fingers at everybody else and saying this is them to blame, no, it's not. Mm -hmm. You brought them in here. You've cultivated this organization of, of a, maybe your culture is off. Maybe you have the the wrong people in the right in the wrong positions. And uh, I got it. Um, is there any uh, general KPIs that you see are the same like common denominator with all the different companies or that, are they just purely industry specific or is, is your sales team, can you like cross train your sales team to come from one company to another company because there's universal principles there? Yeah. Any KPIs that you say are standard? A hundred percent. You know, that, that's, that's the whole model. I, I, Okay. They're trying to build this mini GE structure, sharing resources. <laughs> I, mean, I like that. Yeah, that's that's big. Even, even with the public company I took over, yeah. it's the same same type of strategy. Yeah, everybody within the organization of the reach, we're all there to help one another. And company A can open up a new market for company G because they just got a new client or they just got a new opportunity and a, 
I don't know, national grocery store. We open up a distributor in Japan. And when you start to look at, okay, now where does the additional value come? So as a whole, everything is a, is a machine working together. So you, it's hard to look at it individually because each company serves a purpose to even all the other companies. So that's where it gets really exciting. And that's why I love when companies reach out to me for me to work with them or become part of their teams. Yeah, the ones that are exciting and growing and I can add more growth, that's fun to an extent. But I really love the ones that are completely distraught and distressed and don't know where to go because when I take that and drop it into my environment, we can create instant value. And then you start to look at that company that was failing and their CEO that has no life in them or all the stakeholders that have money trapped. And you can see this energy shift into them feeling good and them feeling like there's yeah. an opportunity, there's, 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 there's a chance for survival. It's the best feeling in the world for me is to give that to people. What, what do you find from a compensation standpoint from your end, do you find uh, what's more attractive to you? Is it the, the salary or is it the, the equity position? Or the, or the exit? I used to always love the equity. That was my MO for a long time because I'm a long-term yeah. player. Um, but there's times where that you need that trapped equity to convert to some liquidity, right? Depending upon what's going on in your life. So I, since 2016, I changed it to a more of a hybrid approach where it's a balance of equity and um, liquidity of some aspect of cash or salaries coming in. So I like the hybrid approach. and. The cool thing about the hybrid approach, if you don't need the cash that month or that quarter, then you just convert it over to more equity. So you have this ability to be flexible with however you want to position your, your portfolio. And that way you keep your income taxes small, exposure less. Love it. Um, I'd like to wrap up our conversation today with uh, what you see, what's going on in the marketplace today. And because yeah. a lot of our followers too, as well, are, are faith, you know, faith, uh, faith centered, uh, they're believers. They have some form of faith in their life, whether it be Muslim, whether it be Christian, whatever, right? Yeah. Uh, but they have faith. God is at the center uh, of their life. Um, wh what's your, what's your perspective of what's going on in, in, in America today? Well, I mean, I'll say the globe, P people are hurting everywhere. The globe, okay. And people are hurting. And, and it's offensive as to that being neglected and just being pushed aside by what I believe are fabricated numbers as to what we're supposed to expect reality is. You know, last month I was behind four people throughout the month that paid in change. The first two times I was like, oh, that's interesting. Paid in change, like coins. Change. Coins, yeah. Then the, after the fourth time I said, they're not paying in change because they want to. They're paying in change because they have to. And this was behind people at a grocery store, at a convenience store. And I'm like, my, my heart broke because that's like, you're on your last leg if you're looking around your house or under your couch or in a coins. water jug for coins. And I don't know what people can do right now to get out of that because not only are things more expensive, but we're supposed to believe inflation is cooled. That was, that was the most offensive report I saw. I think it was cell phones and cars where the inflation dipped. And we're supposed to say, oh, okay, inflation is better. Yeah. People can't afford eggs and milk right now. People are actually have to make a decision for their family where they can't get these basic necessities. And the unfortunate thing is that now that new price becomes the floor. That happens all the time in here. Yeah. It becomes a new floor. Yeah. So not only is people being priced out of what I think are basic necessities, it's actually, and things are actually smaller than if you look at the ounces and the sizes that these manufactured goods are, it's so offensive that now it's more expensive and there's less of it and, and we're supposed to just be okay, the economy's booming, it's a 4% unemployment rate. Everywhere I go, people are looking for work. I open yeah. up my LinkedIn every day, I'm getting hundreds of messages if anybody I know has, has, has any jobs. Yeah. So, you know, it's unfortunate, I think we're going into a, an election moment momentarily and i think things are being done to create a facade yep. of what reality is but people yep. are hurting i don't care what the stock market is people cannot survive right now. well that's well that's the message right now you know one one party says this is the greatest stock market greatest economy that is ever had but the anecdotal stories tell you have you been to a grocery store yeah so yeah. simple as that and and I, I love that your listeners have this faith base because I believe now more than ever, you need God in your life or whatever you look at as far as giving you strength and giving you comfort. And, and you know, now, just like during the pandemic, is a great time to reset and, and think to yourself and your family, like, what do we really need? 
and let's get big back down to basics and get you know to get get at least food shelter and water and some clothing under our belt and from there you know find yeah. happiness enjoying your life and yeah. you're gonna have to pull yourself out of watching a lot of media and a lot of news broadcasts and don't get sucked into that messaging that i think is just there to confuse and scare and create fear and and, and make you feel like you're not capable or not not surviving so yeah. you know look at your family look at your loved ones look to faith and find some comfort because we need that we need that now more than ever you know to, at the beginning of our conversation you're talking about people creating a side hustle you know, that's how i built my business you know 25 years in the insurance industry i went from a military uh, uniform united states marine side business uh, insurance business and then scale it from a one-man operation to a 5,000 man operation and i have me i, mean, I don't have a college degree i had a 2.2 gpa in high school and then we had a, we had an exit a couple of years ago and i've been i uh, i've been insulated from this inflation scenario because i have assets that are just pouring cash thankfully because i made a decision when nobody wanted to make that type of decision get insurance would you stay in the marines well, this is the benefit of me not staying in the Marines, you know, so uh, is there a message you would have out there right now? Brian says, listen, if you really want to get out of um, uh, cha paying and change and, and, and the tough question may be, should you go in business for yourself? Because you're inspiring entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship, you know, uh, within your companies. W would that be a message that you would share with Americans today? Oh, absolutely. And first and foremost, thank you for your service. That, that means the world. I appreciate to it. Thank you, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah. I, I, you, there's so much you can get involved with. I love the idea of a side hustle because it gives you it, it gives you some control, right? If you, there's so many brands out there, the beauty and personal care brands, there's the you know, the Amways of the world. There's things out there that you can go out and build your own little business, and then go to your, your create this network of people you live, little neighborhood of communities. You can rent out a community center for an yeah. event for a night and sell things or introduce yourself as to what you're doing. It you know that little bit of extra income can can be all that you need to just a feel good about yourself and feel like you actually have some control over something because you know, everything else in life is completely out of our control. So if you can find any aspect where you feel like you have say, you feel like you created some you know really good self esteem around you about yeah. what you're doing here and your purpose yeah. in this life, yeah. that's key. You know, I, I think we're all here for a reason. Yeah. And, and going back to faith, I mean, I think if, if even churches and temples and places of worship, they're, they're really meant to be placed in communities and society to help people. Yeah. And before you hopped on a call, you talked about um, a, a Jewish colleague of yours. I grew up around, yeah. I'm a time and raised, yeah. I'm a time and raised Catholic, but I always admired the, the entire different sects of all the Jewish communities that I grew up around. I mean, they all were able to buy homes. They were all able to, be able to create and support families. And most of them was because of the support of the temple. And, yeah. you know, there's there's a lot to religion and its ability to create peace and to create a community and and create this system of really protected and, and, and supported worshipers. So, you know, as corny as it may sound, when I go to church, there's four people in there. So, you know, this may be a time for worship places of worship to really step up and really become an yeah. epicenter for communities that need help. Yeah, that's you know, you know, everybody's talking. You know, we have a series going on in church, right, called God Ethics, where you know the whole conversation about what's the separation of church and state. No, man, church was in the middle of everything <laughs> to begin with. Yeah, it was it was man that decided to separate itself from God. You know, and so a lot, I mean, look at your, your Italian raised uh, Catholic. I mean, the, the European countries had God in the middle of everything. Always. And now you, you, you've just separated everything. And now when you remove God from the scenario, you, you remove standards, morals, values, and principles that keep people morally congruent and talking together. And, and so, you know, uh, I'm, gl I'm glad you, you brought that up. And, and I remember my first commission check when I first saw my first insurance policy. It was 400 bucks. What a great but feeling, it, right? Right, but it was, it was half my military. It was half my military paycheck. You did it. You yeah. did it. Yeah. You went out and That's right. That. That's right. Yeah. That's exactly how I felt. Yeah. I did this in two hours versus two. And and it's like it's like a drug. I, yeah. Every follow up one, I bet was never as high as that feeling you got with your first one. That's right. Right. You're right. And, and until they like create different benchmarks, you know, you create more right. revenue in the company, and, and then those become a new those become the new highs. But the fact that, and then I was going through my and. 
this is a non-clinical answer to it, but people ask me about PTSD all the time. My depression relief was focusing forward in business because what does depression do? Focus you, focus you on the rear of your mirror about what you lived in the past. You continue to live that. Yeah. But entrepreneur focused me forward and without taking drugs or deep counseling, entrepreneurship became my, my ultimate counselor. So, because right. <laughs> you got to get better, right? So, God bless, man. And, and the best is yet to come, I like to say, man. Uh, that's my saying, baby. That's my <laughs> saying right there. The best, our best is yet to come. And, and Brian, your best is yet to come, man. Thanks. I'm looking forward to your companies and uh, let's continue this dialogue. I appreciate just exchanging numbers. But uh, uh, what, what are you excited to uh, uh, share? What can people find more about Brian J. Esposito? Yeah, I'm, I'm always accessible. I like to post uh, my my experiences and journey on online and con connect and communicate with people. So Brian J. Esposito, TikTok, Instagram. I love LinkedIn. That's where I tend to okay. spend a lot of my time sharing my, my stories. Uh, and then, you know, beyond it, to watch what we're doing with DLMI, the public company that took over and really changing the game for traditional ways companies were built and grown with financing and cash flows and growth with the future of digital assets and regulated uh, security tokens, which I've become thankfully a leader in and understanding that space. And yeah. you hear a lot about tokenization now with BlackRock and yeah. securitize. And I've been working on this and uh, building these things over the last 10 years. So it's great to see it get some credibility and hit mainstream. And, and we, yeah. we are the first of its kind public company doing what we're doing. Yeah. And I'm um, very thankful for our team, our advisors and the great global support that we're getting there. Well, I'm looking forward to being able to sell a life insurance policy where there's an index towards some form of crypto, some form of tokenization. I, I'm excited about that. And, uh, yeah. and I think that will help with the modernization of the insurance industry. Because, uh, and a lot of the efficiencies. There's a, there's a lot of costs in all those papers going back and forth. That's right. Cool. With that being said, guys, for those of you watching this right now, make sure you follow Brian here on all the different social media platforms. We'll put all the links below. So with that being said, Brian, thanks for investing a little bit of your time here with the Seven Figure Squad. So that being said, everybody, subscribe, like, until we meet again. Continue to live smart, continue to love smart, and be money smart today. God bless you guys, bye-bye.